and welcome to a new episode of Mind Expanding Russian. That guy who continues to talk about the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. And I've got a topic for you today, which is ketamine. So ketamine has been quite discussed recently due to many reasons. And I decided that it's time to allocate some time and talk specifically about this particular entheogen. This is an entheogen unlike others. It is very different from classic psychedelics like psilocybin or LSD because it belongs to a slightly different type of active substance which is called dissociative. What it means is that it dissociates you from your body so it is as if your mind or psyche or consciousness or however you call it basically exists outside of your physical body and shape and form and it leads to a very fundamental experience that may question the fabric of reality at some point in time but first things first let's uh, go back and talk about uh, where it all started so in 1958 a predecessor of ketamine was synthesized it is called pcp well, widely known street drug or fencyclidin. I'm not going to talk about fencyclidin or PCP in details and how it works on the human body or psyche. I'm just gonna mention that it is widely known um, in the streets and uh, widely used in recreationally. However, it's quite dangerous uh, if it is consumed in big quantities as well as ketamine. By the way, by the end of this episode, you will know whether or not ketamine is dangerous and uh, whether or not it can lead to death. Hmm, <laughs> intriguing, right? But yeah, let's pause that for a moment and go on that historic journey one more time. So, in 1956, um, PCP got synthesized and then it was used as a uh, anesthetic to basically put people down uh, when they are being operated. So if there is a surgery, if there is something else that needs to be done that would require a lot of pain, it is easier to turn a human off so that one doesn't experience such pain and, you know, then be able to conduct the procedure, cut whatever necessary, open whatever is necessary and stuff like that. So it took some time to understand that PCP has additional side effects which which are hallucinogenic and back in the day it was not favorable to produce such type of side effects for people who are going under anesthesia. That's why pharmacologists played with the molecule and six years after fencyclidin was originally synthesized they resynthesized a slightly different molecule which is nowadays widely known as ketamine. Ketamine was synthesized in 1962, but it took some time and it took several years to understand how it works. And, of course, because it, it was a derivative, it was supposed to work in the same manner, and it did. It is still widely used uh, in the world as an aesthetic that, again, is being used for surgeries. It was widely used during the Vietnam War to operate on injured soldiers who went there to kill innocent civilians, you know, from another part of the world. Uh, but yeah, let's put that topic aside. <clears throat> so in the 60s, people tried to understand how ketamine works. And um, unlike other classic psychedelics that I mentioned before, it doesn't affect serotonin 2A receptor or 5-HT2A receptor. It works in a different manner. So it doesn't affect serotonin production. It affects a system called NMDA. And I'm gonna try and pronounce properly what M NMDA stands for. So NMDA stands for N-methyl-D-aspartate receptor, right? What the hell that means? Um, you don't need to dig into the details or understand the neuroscience behind it. Basically, the idea here is that the effect and the mechanism of its effect on humans' brain is slightly different from the other psychedelics like 
psilocybin or LSD, for instance. So the studies went on in the 60s, and at some point in time, people uncovered the therapeutic potential, or basically the side effects led them to think this way. So when people were put under prior to going to surgery, and then when they came back to the conscience, they experienced a very different type of feelings, let's put it this way. So some of them were able to reevaluate their life or something like that, and that made people think like whether or not it is possible to use that substance and therapeutic potential. So there were many trials, multiple trials all over the world, mainly in US and Europe as well, but not only there. In USSR also, ketamine was trialed and tested for a variety of ways to treat not only depression, but alcohol use disorder. Moreover, there were two particular individuals that placed a lot of time and effort into not only understanding how it all works, but also treated a lot of people. Roughly 10 plus thousand people in the USSR were treated with ketamine in the context of alcohol use disorder. So as you can understand, there is a therapeutic potential for ketamine to be used in, in treating with various types of illnesses. So nowadays it is used for treatment of treatment resistant depression and different variations of really hard types of depression. It is also being used to treat PTSD and as you now understand it is also used to treat substance use disorder. Mainly alcohol but not only, it could also be nicotine, it could be also opiates like heroin or fentanyl or something like that and other variations of it. Actually, it can be used to treat other substance use disorder like uh, marijuana, for instance, because it is a substance and sometimes it, be, it is being used inappropriately by uh, people uh, when they consume it in big amounts in everyday case, basically. So if we're talking, for instance, about substance use disorder, if somebody's using Mary Jane more than twice a week, it yeah. means that person is addicted to such substance and you can say that there is no physical addiction, there is mental or psychological addiction. But let's put that aside for a moment and go back to ketamine, right? So ketamine is relatively young substance, as you now know, it was synthesized in the middle of 20th century and over the course of past 70 years, it's been tried and tested, and there's a lot of studies showcasing that there is efficacy. So there is a clinical base saying that it works and it helps. And how does it help? So the approach in ketamine-assisted therapy or psychedelic-assisted therapy is somewhat similar. However, it is slightly different. People are being taught up front what are they going to experience, then of course experience is happening in the controlled environment, in a clinical setting or a hospital setting. And then an integration session follows, and this was the way that was used by Dr. Kropitsky in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia, or Soviet Russia back in the day who used this to help people get rid of alcohol. And originally they were taught about the, the dangers of alcohol and how it affects their brain. And once they were in the substance and the high concentration of it, they then were given a taste of spirit. And if one tasted spirit, something like pure spirit or vodka or something like that, you can say that it's quite awful if you taste it, it, it gives you no pleasure at all. And people had this strong association with this disgust that they've experienced in the moment when they were high on cadmium. And then, of course, when they were drawn back to real regular life, they had a follow-up and in the shape of a integration session when they were uh, talked through the experience that they received and try to make sense of it all. The thing about uh, ketamine experience is that a human mind dissociates with the body and travels to, I wouldn't call it another dimension because it is different from DMT. 
and substances like that basically there is no feeling that there is a body that there is no connection between mind and body there is only mind that is absent somewhere there in total darkness or nothingness if you can say it this way and the ego dissolution that is connected to the therapeutic potential of entheogens is happening so again the ego dissolves it disappears there is no concept of i or me there is just pure conscious and in those moments people have a have an opportunity to touch with the deep levels of their psyche with their subconsciousness and then be able to observe either traumatic situation or their own behavior or reevaluate something in their life like relationships with their beloved ones or something different like relationship with the substance they've been abusing for some time so talking about the therapeutic potential at some point in time one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world johnson and jordan johnson and johnson or actually their subsidiary janssen if i remember correctly trialed and tested a variation of ketamine molecule called S-ketamine and there are a couple of variations one is called R-ketamine the other one is called S-ketamine from the perspective of its effect on human mind and the uh, possibilities of alteration of perception of reality they don't differ significantly they're either less or longer lasting but other than that they're pretty much similar so johnson johnson patented a specific molecule and then they've branded it and now they're selling it as an over-the-counter drug called spravato which can be purchased in some countries however um not only johnson and johnson been using ketamine for treatment the ketamine the so-called ketamine clinics have been operational across the united states for quite some time not only there in Switzerland, for instance, in Ukraine as well, for several years, people have been treated with ketamine. Unfortunately, in Russia, they are no longer treated with ketamine because as of uh, middle of 90s, to be precise, 1996, ketamine is prohibited and is in the list of illegal substances along with other entheogens. I have a theory, though, that it happened all due to the U.S. involvement in Russian politics because this was the year when Boris Yeltsin got elected with the help of the United States. And since the administration back in the day was run by Bill Clinton, who is known by his, I don't know how to call it, policy against drug use, I think that it, there is a connection there because there was a proven therapeutic effect of ketamine but then all of a sudden it just got prohibited. Of course ketamine is not that safe and when I say of course I mean that classic psychedelics again let's list them psilocybin, LSD or mescaline ayahuasca as well or dmt to be precise they're not lethal there's no lethal dose of those but that doesn't mean that you can use as much as you want you can it can be dangerous and you can definitely harm yourself especially if you're not following the safety guidelines that i've talked about before watch that video make sure you're safe and don't forget about the set and setting and ideally uh, guide that would a uh, sitter that would be there to accompany you and make sure that you're not gonna do any stupid shit but ketamine is not that safe so the idea here is that it is anesthetic so ketamine is anesthetic right so what does it mean if you take too much of it you lose your consciousness and it can be dangerous especially if you are somewhere near water or other places where it can lead to either injuries or direct death so ketamine on itself can be dangerous moreover a specific dosage can lead to a lethal consequences so there are different sources that say that the dosage varies uh, the mortal dosage so typically for the therapeutic use the dosage that is being injected intravenously is half a milligram so 500 milligrams to be precise but from here on if you increase the dosage in the single use one it can lead to fatal consequences so there are 
couple of sources saying that the lethal dose starts as of 678 milligrams per 70 kilo of weight for a person. There are other sources saying that lethal dose is 4.2 gram. However, I would definitely not recommend to anybody to do a single shot or snort or whatever of ketamine exceeding of 600 milligrams per person that is 70 kilos of weight because it can lead to consequences and you may not want to do that if you want to continue your life. So how does ketamine work in, in brain? So I'm not going to go into explaining how it reacts with the NMD8 receptors, but I will mention that it leads to neuroplasticity, it leads to changes in the brain and the growth of neurons, well, at least to the best of my knowledge. But if I'm wrong here, please put it in the comments and I'll be happy to correct myself. Nevertheless, so when people are being treated with the depression, they are being ingested with the ketamine and in the majority of cases that is sufficient on its own. So if you think about psychedelic assisted therapy, ketamine is slightly different because here people have a kind of their own process. So in a sense, they don't need the doctor per se because everything that is happening is happening inside their brain and the experience that they have is happening extremely on a personal level and that cannot be explained easily with words in many cases. However, it is still critical and it is still important to make sense of that experience because it is your psyche and this is what is happening with you. It's not something that is brought from the external world. It's not like your neighbors are knocking on your door. It is your subconscious interacting with your conscious even though you are in an altered state of mind. So one other thing about ketamine is that it is addictive. It is not physically addictive. So you cannot get addicted to it as if it was heroin or fentanyl or something like that. So in theogens, in the majority of cases, they're not addictive. However, psychological addiction may be possible here because, for example, the product that Johnson & Johnson is marketing is the nasal spray. It is easy to use and it can be used at as and when one decides to do it. Of course, there is prescription, there is a instruction on how to use it, how often was the dosage, etc. But people can abuse it. So imagine the scenario, somebody's working and, you know, it's been a tough week. And a lot happened. Maybe, you know, one of the relatives is ill or something like awful or dreadful happened. Or maybe nothing happened. It's just life, you know. Sometimes it may feel as if you are depressed and if you have access to a substance at the end of Friday you can just ingest it and then get an immediate release of the tension. Basically it alleviates the kind of depression symptoms so to speak. But here lies the danger. So if you get used to it you can start abusing the substance and every now and then once you feel bad or not in the mood you just grab the spray and use it. I'm not talking about Johnson Johnson's particular product. Please use the instructions and, you know, consult with your physician, the doctor, and ask them whether or not it's dangerous in the first place. But I do want you to understand that it can lead to addiction. So there has been a recently discussed, uh, vitally discussed case um, around the death of Matthew Perry. So Matthew Perry was one of the key stars in a TV show called Friends and I've seen Friends probably like twice the entire series when I was young and then uh, in my I don't know teen ages or I don't know how you call it properly but anyway so the toxicology report postmortem um, led to a conclusion that Matthew Perry died of acute effects of ketamine so the thing you need to know is that Matthew Perry has been uh, struggling for decades with the substance use disorder, mainly alcohol, but not only. And moreover, he went through a uh, treatment in a Swiss clinic and that Swiss clinic charged him something like 150,000 Swiss francs, which is roughly 150,000 euros. Yeah, you do the math in your own currency. The idea there is that 
he went to a clinic to get specific treatment and then a week after he died. He didn't die because he went to the clinic, neither he died because of the academy that was administered at the clinic because it's not how it works. So when you consume ketamine, it takes roughly 10 minutes or so, and then you, your mind goes to a journey, and the journey lasts roughly hour, hour and a half. So that, of course, depends on the individual and depending on the dosage, because some people consume ketamine on dance floors and continue with their life. But of course, the, there are smaller dosages. I, I don't really understand how people do it. I try to administer it myself in a therapeutic approach and uh, of course it was a higher dose than the small one and yeah, it just was lying there not being able to move really. But yeah, it was a really different experience. So anyway, <clears throat> going back to the academy, it, it lasts roughly an hour and a half and after like a couple of hours, it, it's no longer effective in a sense. But Matthew Perry didn't die of ketamine, he died because his lungs were filled with water. He, wa he drowned in the pool, uh, but um, the reason they wrote that he died because of the acute effects of ketamine is probably he was consuming ketamine on his own, without the supervision, without the sitter, and in a dangerous environment, in a pool. So, don't ever do that shit, okay? First and foremost, if you know that you have a tendency to abuse substances, well, ideally don't abuse them, but I wish it was that easy, right? Make sure that you don't you create a situation where you cannot risk your life. And if there is somebody who can help you out, if there is somebody who can watch you while you're consuming it, be the sitter for you, make sure you do it. Other than that, uh, seek for help and it is possible to treat the addiction regardless of what type of addiction it is, whether it's heroin, whether it's alcohol, marijuana, or ketamine. It is all possible, but of course it requires a lot of effort, a lot of concentration, and a lot of will. But will is a muscle that can be trained, so uh, there's a light for you, definitely. So let me kind of summarize what I've been talking about during this podcast episode. So, by the way, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and put your comments in the comment section. I'll get back to you. But yeah, so the summary here is that ketamine is one of the youngest entheogens out there. It is completely synthesized. It is a widely used an aesthetic, widely used because it is in the UN list of kind of necessary substances. So basically, people still undergo surgery um, under ketamine. Ketamine is proven to treat various types of depression and uh, treatment-resistant depression as well, PTSD, anxiety, and other variations of mental illnesses. However, ketamine can be dangerous. It affects an MDA receptor, unlike 5-HT2A receptor that is being addressed by the classical psychedelics. Ketamine can be psychologically addictive, and it can lead to lethal consequences if used in an inappropriate set and setting. So please be mindful about that, especially nowadays when in US you can go to a ketamine clinic that is located in just the mall. You go there, they don't ask many questions, they put a needle in, you're tripping and there you are. You are on ketamine and treating yourself. So the barriers to kind of getting the treatment are lowered, but people are not being taught about the potential dangers of the substance. And it's important to understand it all, because even though entheogens are relatively safe, some of them can lead to lethal consequences. So please be mindful about that and be mindful about the people who are using it in your surrounding. Make sure that they know about the potential dangers. So that's it for today's episode. Again, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, put it in the comments. I want to hear your thoughts and I will get back to you. Thanks and until next time.